uh, he is coaching some baseball. I think he said this is his last tournament of the year, and I know he is relieved for that to happen. So um, I'll be filling in his place. My name is uh, Sean. I'm the youth pastor here. And uh, man, I don't know about you guys, but are you guys awake this morning? I feel like last night was the 4th of July. Oh, I, think, I think the Revolutionary War came through my neighborhood. We refought the British last night. I think we won again, so I think, uh, oh my goodness, but I don't know. I think my definition of midnight is different than my neighbor's definition, but Jesus said to love them, amen? amen. <laughs> All right, well, we are this morning. We're going to continue with our series that Brett began last week titled, one nation under God. And if there's a message we need to hear this morning uh, on the day after the 4th of July is one nation under God. I appreciated Brett's message last week. I don't know about you guys. Like, I was ready to walk out of here and like, I don't know, yell stuff, yell, yell things. I don't know, hit things. Not people, but just hit things. I was excited. <laughs> Some of the insights that he brought, uh, they, were, they were really eye-opening to me. I especially appreciate the title of the series because it's the idea of this one nation under God that, that spurred me back in 2003 to enlist into the U.S. Army. I can still remember September 11th, 2001, as many of you guys can recall vividly in your memory, uh, right where you were. I was a sophomore in high school. I was heading into my government class uh, in the morning, and when we got there, uh, we were... We were the only ones there. We were the, the students. We were it. The teacher, he was a very old-fashioned sort of guy. He was very punctual. He was the type, you know, you're 15 minutes early and you're still late kind of guy. So we were excited. We were going to get one up on him when he came in, and we were going to rub it in. You're late. You know, we, we finally had one up on him. But when he came in, his face was, you know, you could see the distress on his face. And so that killed our antics right there. He goes on to tell us about the atrocities that had just taken place in New York City uh, only moments before. And I remember my initial reaction was, I was scared. Uh, I remember having that fear, though. Uh, it turned into anger very quickly. And then I remember that anger being mixed with patriotism, uh, turned into this melting pot of zealousness for national pride and all the moralistic and, and Christian principles that this nation stands for. That zealousness continued into July of, of 03 when I turned 17. And then by December, I was enlisted in the Nebraska, Nebraska Army National Guard. I was on reserve, ready to go to basic training between my junior and senior year of high school. I couldn't wait until I graduated to get in. I had to do something. I was ready to fight for what I believed in in this country. One nation under God a phrase that was adopted into the Pledge of Allegiance by President Eisenhower on Flag Day in 1954. Days before, Eisenhower introduced a bill that would add the words of under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. He attended a church service at New York Avenue Presbyterian. Uh, he listened to a sermon that was based on the Gettysburg Address from the very pew that Abraham Lincoln would sit in week after week. This was Abraham Lincoln's church. He listened as the pastor explained that Lincoln's words of under God in his famous address is what has set the United States apart from any other nation. After I was signed into law, he said this. He said, from this day forward, the millions of our school children will daily proclaim in every city and town, every village and rural schoolhouse, the dedication of our nation and our people to the Almighty. In this way, we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way, we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace or in war. So these, these are the things that make me proud to be an American. And it's reasons like these that inspire the 17-year-old version of myself to strap on combat boots for the first time. Now, being on the other side of a nine-year enlistment in, in the military that included a, a, a year-long tour in Iraq in support of I Operation Iraqi Freedom, I'm still earnest and passionate about supporting this country that was built on God-honoring principles. 
But I have to tell you guys, I am more concerned now with the direction our country is headed than at any point in my life. I know many of you share that same concern. I think Pastor Brett summed it up well last week when he said, the wheels have fallen off. I don't know about you, but for me, it's been a very spiritually draining and grueling last couple weeks. Are any of you guys Facebookers? Some social media people? Yeah, you guys, you can relate to my unease. No question the topic of choice by just about everyone in this, uh, everybody in the world, it seems like right now, is the Supreme Court ruling to legalize same-sex marriage. And for good reason. Let me, let me preface this morning a little bit by, by saying it's not my intention to create a political debate, but for the purposes of relating this to the biblical passages we're going to get into, I want to, I want to linger here for just a second. But the ruling of the Supreme Court in and of itself concerns me greatly, first for the nature of the law itself that was enacted, but I also have concern for the line between governmental powers that has become blurred to a new height like never before. You guys remember American government class, American history. One of the very first things that we learn is the separation of powers. And we got a, we got a little slide here with the separation. All right, this is easy. We know this stuff, right? The legislative branch is your Congress, your House of Representatives. It's the Senate. You know their function, right? They're, they're the ones who, they make the laws. Then you got the executive branch, your office of the president, the vice president. You got his cabinet enforce the laws or carry out the law. And then you got, of course, the judicial, I can't even say it, judicial branch, Supreme Court of the United States, you have the federal courts and court systems all the way down. It's their job to interpret the law. So the idea of the three branches is to separate governmental power in such a way that no one branch can impose itself upon another. James Madison, our fourth President of the United States. You guys remember him from between naps in, in American history? Me neither. But he said that, of the separation of powers, he said that an elective, meaning uh, uh, people with power, a person with power, normally with kind of malicious uh, ideas behind it, but an elective despot was not the government we fought for, but one in which the powers of government should be so divided and balanced among as that no one could transcend their legal limits without being effectu effectually checked and restrained by others. But what we see in light of the recent Supreme Court ruling isn't the proper separation of powers at work. We don't see these principles of restraint being enacted here. But this isn't just my opinion. Some conservative youth pastor from the middle of Bible country. Listen to these quotes. This is from Chief Justice Antonin Scalia. He's the longest serving justice in the court that was appointed by Ronald Reagan back in 1986. I was one years old when this dude took office. 30 years, three decades. But these are his comments, the passing of same-sex marriage. He says, a system of government that makes the people, you and I, subordinate to a committee of nine unelected lawyers, AKA the Supreme Court, does not deserve to be called a democracy. Supreme Court Justice, one of the guys sitting on the panel of the nine, he goes on to say this practice of constitutional revision by an unelected committee of nine, always accompanied as it is today by extravagant praise of liberty, robs the people of the most important liberty they asserted in the Declaration of Independence and won in the Revolution of 1776, the freedom to govern themselves. This guy, he's sitting on the bench of the Supreme Court. He's noticed this influx of power that this Supreme Court has inherited. And he's not just any guy, but he's a guy that sat on the bench again for three long decades. If anybody knows democracy, this would be one of those guys. John Roberts said, another guy who sits right down the row from Scalia, he said, the majority's decision, talking about the, the five major judges who, who made the decision, is an act of will, not legal judgment. The right it announces has no basis in the Constitution or this court's precedence. Just who do we think we are? But the quote that is probably the most disturbing for me and, and why I'm going here with this whole point, 
disturbing to you, church, is what another chief justice said, one of the minority, Clarence Thomas. He says, the majority's decision, speaking again of the five chief justices, threatens the religious liberty our nation has long sought to protect. Your liberty, according to a guy on the Supreme Court, in the Supreme Court, he's saying your liberty is at risk. What we're doing here this morning, what you do freely every Sunday, it could be something of the past for your kids. These are chief justices, the men who know it's their job to interpret the law, not make new ones, not enforce new ones. One of my favorite examples of people who advocate for the reservation of the separation of powers is our seventh president, Andrew Jackson. You know Andrew from the $20 bill. Unless you're like me, I'm broke all the time. I don't know Andrew Jackson other than from history. I'm a youth pastor. <laughs> but Andrew Jackson had a number of Supreme Court decisions come down to him, including Worcester versus Georgia and Osborne versus the United States Bank. Important cases. But when the decisions for those cases came down to him and the Supreme Court, they said, Mr. President, here's what you have to do, and here's what we have decided is constitutional. Uh, I love what he said to them in response. Jackson looked at this, the decision of the Supreme Court, and he said, the Chief Justice has made his decision. Let's see if he can enforce it. He said, you know, that's the, that's the opinion of the Supreme Court, but I want to see them come over here to the White House and make me enforce it. There's no way they're going to make me do it. He said, each public officer who takes an oath to support the Constitution swears that he will support it as he understands it and not as it's understood by others. So in other words, he's saying, I took an oath of the President of the United States to uphold the Constitution. I didn't take an oath as the President of the United States to uphold the opinion of the Supreme Court. He also says, the opinion of the judges, Supreme Court, has no more authority over the Congress than the opinion of Congress has over the judges. And on that point, the president is independent of both. The authority of the Supreme Court must not, therefore, be permitted to control the Congress or the executive. See, Andrew Jackson is advocating for a proper view of separation of power. He calls each separate branch to differing opinions and differing authorities as to not be controlled by one another. Something that was evidently absent two weeks ago in the legislation that effectively uh, passed by the Supreme Court and something the current chief justices on the bench are calling our attention to as the American people. They're sounding the horn. See, originally when the Supreme Court would review an act of Congress... Their verdict was regarded as a judicial opinion and not as an enactment of law. Andrew Jackson knew this, and you can tell it by his words. But the shift we see, the shift occurred in the late 1700s, early 1800s, with cases like Marbury versus Madison. Remember, go back to history class, Marbury versus Madison. This uh, process of reviewing law is called judicial review. And it's a power that was never lawfully given to the Supreme Court by the drafters of the Constitution, but the power was seemingly inherited over time. Marbury versus Madison set the precedent for judicial review in 1803. But in the 1830s, right, 27 years after this, uh, this precedent had been set by this court case, Jackson proclaims, and he's able to proclaim from his office that the opinion of the judges has no more authority over the Congress than the opinion of the Congress has over the judges, and then the president is separate from both. So even though the precedence was set by Marbury versus Madison, it was never intended to give the Supreme Court power over the other two branches, as we see today. Instead of the three branches of government applying the proper checks and balances, you really get nine men sitting on the bench of the Supreme Court, enacting laws in this country that are, you know, that's supposed to be functioning as a democracy. And really what you end up getting is a fox guarding the hen house sort of scenario. You get the federal government judging the constitutionality of its own laws. Good luck checking morality with that stance. 
My whole point in all of this, the reason I bring it up, and my major concern in all this, as should be yours if you're a worshiper of Jesus Christ, is that we are losing touch with the very principles that this country was founded upon. Brett went into this. It's Christian principles that this very, the very foundation of this country was founded upon, and, and they're being challenged, and they're being done away in liberties seemingly daily, fleet us. Compare that claim to the words of Zachary Taylor, who was our 12th president. He says that the Bible is the best of books. I wish it were in the hands of everyone. It is indispensable to the safety and the permanence of our institutions. In other words, if we want those institutions to continue, the free, the Republican form of government, then we have to know the Bible. He said a government, a free government cannot exist without religion and morals. And there cannot be morals without religion, nor religion without the Bible. Is it any coincidence then that as the United States steps further and further into its identity as a post-Christian nation, that it more resembles a socialistic or federalism-style government than it does a republic. If you look closer at the separation of powers, you will find that even its origins are from the Bible. The founders' desire to separate and check governmental powers was rooted in the principle we find in Jeremiah 17.9. That verse says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked, Who really knows? Short answer, God. But the founders knew that the unrestrained heart of men moves naturally toward moral and civil degradation unless directly acted upon the positive influence of their creator. They believe that society would be a much safer place if powers didn't come from one place, but there was a system of checks and balances. And many of the founders specifically cite this Bible verse as the source of their reasoning on this aspect of government. To reiterate what uh, Pastor Brett shed light on last week, it was Christian principles that effectively built this country. And it was Christian principles that were breathed into documents such as the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. 95% of the men that were considered our founding fathers, they were Christian. And you don't hear that today. You hear people trying to paint them in an opposite light. But how do we know? How do we know it's 95%? That's a heck of a claim. Well, we we can conclude that about 255 men are considered founding fathers. A founding father defined as a person who had a substantial impact on the birth and the establishment of America as an independent nation. So over 240 of the 255 founders were Christians, and we can prove that by their personal writings and other such documents that exist today in the archives of Congress. We can prove that. But this number of men, it it includes the five men who wrote the Declaration of Independence and the other 51 who signed the document. Of those 56 men, get this, 29 of them were ordained ministers. Of the men who formed the Constitution, all but three of the 55 delegates who attended the Constitutional Convention held in Philadelphia, where our current Constitution was birthed and signed, were members of Orthodox Christian churches. All but three. The vast majority of the first United States Congress, the 90 men who framed the Bill of Rights, were Christian. So 240 of the 255 people uh, that, that birthed our country, founding fathers, we can prove historically through their writings, through other such documents, that they had a Christian faith. So let that sink in for a second. Don't you think that with the vast majority of our founding fathers being Christian, that the Constitution would therefore be influenced by their Christian worldview? What about the Declaration? Obviously, we got to answer yes, right? But that's not the message we hear today. Just yesterday, I, I got on CNN. Dot, excuse me, dot com, and there was the, the headline, Were Our Founders Christians? They said yes and no. 
But we here at best, our founding fathers were deists. They believed in some type of God, that a God exists in some shape, way, or form, while many remained atheists or agnostic. But that portrayal of these men is built on no historical fact. And my whole point this morning uh, in exposing that lie is to give the truth to the church. So why then? Why is this such a common idea in our day? Why are there so many people convinced of this idea that our founders were anything but Christian? I got a video clip. Like you guys to check out. We started changing at least the way we deal. We started changing at least the way we deal with American history in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. We went from a very substantial view of having God involved in American history to a very secular view of American history. Uh, we look back in the early textbooks in the 1700s, 1800s. This is one of the most popular textbooks in American history. It was from 1878. This was used in public schools for generations. And the author of that textbook, Charles Coffin, calls the story of liberty. He says, if you do not see the divine hand working behind the scenes with what's going on in history, history will be an incomprehensible enigma. And that's what it's become for American students. We've taken God's hand out of history. No longer does anything have meaning. It's just a series of dates and places and events. There's not a purpose to history. It's an incomprehensible enigma. Very few really like history today as it's taught. But we used to teach history in a very different way. In the 1920s and 30s and 40s, we had a whole new group of historical writers that appeared on the scene. Charles and Mary Beard, W.E. Woodward, Fairfax Downey, and they started saying, you know, the, the only thing that really motivates people is money. That's all that anybody cares about. Let's teach history that way. Wow. So they started writing a whole series of textbooks that were what were called the economic view of history. The economic view of the Declaration, the economic view of the Constitution, the economic view of the American people, everything was economics. Well, the problem with that is when you apply that paradigm to American history, and we did that officially in the 1960s, textbook writers adopted what's called the economic view of American history. The result is now of 40, 60, 70 years of being taught economic view, when you study the Declaration of Independence today, we learn that America was founded. The reason they did the Declaration of Independence was because of taxation without representation. Right. Well, that's an economic reason. The problem with that is the Declaration gave 27 different reasons that we became an independent nation. Now, taxation without representation was 17 of the 27. <laughs> It wasn't even their top list. It, it wow. wasn't that substantial. I mean, it was an issue. It was definitely an issue, but it was not the issue. It was in the bottom half of their list on why they separated from Great Britain. So under this economic view of American history that we've had for 70 years, it affects the way we see government. It affects what we think government should be about, what government's supposed to be uh, about jobs and stopping the outsourcing and economics. And no, any given session of Congress Congress deals with between 10 and 13,000 bills a session. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those bills have nothing to do with economics, but we'll never hear that on the news. Wow. And that's the problem we have with American history. We've taught that history deals only with economics. It's all government's about, and it's all we see anymore. So, we so to summarize what he's saying, that it's clear that we started teaching history through the eyes of the dollar bill. What's new? When you take God out of history, History becomes a meaningless set of names and numbers, events that have no meaning toward one to the next, an incomprehensible enigma. That is a hard word to say. It's a bunch of random events. It's no wonder something then as enticing as money was put into its place to spur interest. As a result, we are primary taught, taught in our schools that, that one of the 27 reasons the colony's desire to separate from the rule of Great Britain was, of course, the one we all know, taxation without representation. We don't hear mention today in our classrooms the locations of our primary means of learning history about the more prominent religious and moral issues that our founders wrote into the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the King of Great Britain, King George III, he wouldn't allow the colonies to have Bible societies. He towed their missionary societies. He demanded an established church, meaning that they had no freedom. They had no religious freedom to go to the church of their choice. These are the reasons the colonies desire to separate. 
Eleven of the clauses of the Declaration deal with abuse of governmental power, specifically representative power. Seven deal with military issues. Four deal with judicial abuses. Two with moral issues. And, and the others were religious. But all we hear today is taxation without representation. We are given American history through an economic slant. So is it any wonder then that today we evaluate our president by economic criteria? He's no longer evaluated on morals and principles or the social reforms that he brings, but we ask questions like, how's the economy doing? Is it better or worse since he's been in office? What's the unemployment rate? What's the value of the U.S. dollar when we compare it to the rest of the world? All the things our country as a whole bases on the outcomes of a presidency in the White House permeates from the dollar bill. But okay, why does it matter? Why does it matter how history has been passed down to us? What effect does it have on you and your children today? Another video clip. American history, or better said, our view of American history, has a substantial impact on our behavior today. The U.S. Supreme Court's a great example. Every time you go into the U.S. Supreme Court, you're arguing about a document that's 200 years old. You're right. arguing about the Constitution. And so one side says, well, here's what that clause means. Another side says, no, 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 here's the history of that clause. And so the way we view our history, even on our American documents, affects the way we live today. So history is something substantial. I think that's a big reason that there is such a huge emphasis on history in the Bible. God gives us verse after verse that tells us to recall the former days, remember the former times, to know our history. Um, you find that even revivals that are associated in the scriptures deal with rediscovering history, as it was with Josiah. They found that old scroll in the temple, they brought it out, they read it, and they said, you mean we used to be like this? Led to a national revival. The whole thing that saved the nation with, with Esther was Mordecai was about to be hung, the king read the history book. He said, I forgot that happened. Yeah. And it turned the gallows of Haman from Mordecai to actually hanging Haman. Right. So history is a huge thing as far as current, modern. So how we view history then changes how we act in the present, changes how we act today. Uh, in 1844, there was a court case called Vidal versus Gerard's Executors. Uh, yeah, it sounds more like a summer blockbuster to me that I want to go see after church today. But in this court case, the Supreme Court unanimously decided that if a school were going to be government funded, it was going to be government operated, it was going to be a government administrated uh, school that they had to teach the Bible. They said that you can't expect to get government funding teaching the Bible. But with the secularization a secularization of the government, including a secular view of history being taught. In June of 1963, there were two court cases of particular importance uh, that came about to us. Uh, one was Abington School District versus Shemp. The other was Murray versus Curlette. The result of these cases effectively took the Bible out of our schools for the very first time in America. The time of the Supreme Court, uh, themselves, they, they themselves, they actually acknowledged that there was no historical or legal precedent to do so, but they ruled to go ahead and take the Bible out anyway. Why? Well, obviously the importance of the government being founded on Chris, Christian principles wasn't making its way through history anymore. Instead of adhering to our country's foundational principles, all which are found in the Bible itself, the Supreme Court went with the advice of a psychologist named Solomon Grazel. And Grazel testified on the effects that the Bible would have on, on their kids if they were to read it in schools. And this is what uh, this doctor said. He said, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the child. So we discover that the Bible now gives brain damage to our children. The Supreme Court... To this guy, they said, well, you know, Mr. Grazel or Dr. Grazel, that's exactly what we think. So based on his testimony, the Bible was then removed from our schools. This secularization and this godlessness continues for a country that doesn't build 
its laws and regulations on the word of God any longer. Look no further than the ruling that happened on June 26th to evidence that. One of my favorite Bible teachers, a man named Greg Steer, uh, he's the founder of Dare to Share Ministries, a guy I've looked up to for a long time. He said this recently. He said, once God's word no longer considered the authority on truth, everything is up for grabs. We already see people suing because they can't marry two wives. Already. So what is probably the most ironic thing to me in all of this is that the more physical freedoms the people of our country think they are gaining by writing them into law, the more they are spiritually binding themselves up. This then is effectively separating them from the freedom that they truly desire and the freedom that they truly need. True freedom from the penalty of breaking God's law by our sin. True freedom from God's deserved wrath. And true freedom by being bound by the law that cannot save but condemns us when we try to abide by it. Uh, Being the 4th of July season, I want to concentrate on the law that condemns, but more so I want to concentrate on the freedom that God offers from this law that attempts to eternally bind us and enslave us. But laws, before we get into the main point, laws, they're, they're often impossible to keep, amen? Uh, if it's been done and somebody didn't like it, somebody's written a law against it. Uh, take this for example, uh, North Carolina, do you know it's illegal to sing off key? You cannot sing off key. Where's, uh, where's David, our worship leader? There you are. Hey, uh, hey David. Listen up, buddy. It's against a lot of sing-off key in North Carolina. Some guy named William Linkaw was fined an entire penny in 1872 for disturbing the peace because his constant singing had angered and annoyed his fellow congregation members of his church. Should have known it was church people all along. But David, are you listening? Yeah, we're, we're listening to you, so just so you know. Uh, in Wyoming, using a firearm to fish is strictly forbidden. Where are you feeling? I give. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> uh, here's one from Nebraska. Drivers on mountains should drive with caution and near the right hand edge of the highway. From Nebraska, drivers on mountains. Because there's no mountains, but it's a law. These are true. My personal, my personal favorite, though, from, uh, from Nebraska is if a child burps during church, his parents may be arrested. Y'all know I'm the youth pastor, right? Like, I could probably have the majority of you parents arrested right now. So, <laughs> where's Cody Bland? Is he here today? He's a, he's a city police officer. We, I need to talk to him after, if he's out there. <laughs> but like the gods that govern our country, God himself also has a law. The Bible says this of God's law. That the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. That's one of my favorites. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it. All. That one's a little harsher. But wait, there's more. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. God's law is rough. It's, it's impossible for you to completely follow and obey. Contrast this idea with the words of Jesus now from Matthew 5. You must be perfect. Your Father in heaven is perfect. And then the capstone verse of all of this, Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So that's you and that's me and according to the Bible, we cannot live up to the perfection that God has given us. So what happens when we don't live up to God's standard? Romans 6.23, for the payoff of sin is death. So to understand freedom then and appreciate freedom, we have to first understand our slavery to the law that binds us. Under God's holy law, we're all slaves. It is sin that is our slave master and keeps us bound. 
Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Stay here with me. One more important verse. Romans 3. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Off the pages of the Bible itself. So did you get that? Following the law cannot and will not save you. But why is that true? Because you can't do it. Because you have to fulfill it perfectly if you set out to do it. God gave the law to show us our sinfulness, to show us our depravity, and to show us that our sin takes us far past the point of ever being able to redeem ourselves. So you think you can live a life uh, on your own and be forgiven by God? Well, let's ask him. Isaiah 64, 6. We're all infected and impure with sin. When we discover our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we will wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. To the ones who conclude that they are a good enough person to go to heaven someday, here's what God says. No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Are you guys yet? Do you see the hopelessness of the situation? See, God is true. He has a law. You violated it. And the penalty for violating that law is death. Eternal conscious torment. So should we become angered then at God at this impossible situation? Should our response be to hate this impossible law he's put into place? I'm telling you, the Bible has every answer. Romans 7. Well then, and this is Paul, Apostle Paul. Well then, am I suggesting the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin then came into my life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. This brings us to the point of utter despair if you have a heartbeat. No one who is in their right mind wants to spend eternity in hell separated from God. But according to everything that we have just read, that's our destination. If God is good and God is love, if he's light and if he's fullness of joy, then hell is the removal of all those things. The opposite of good being bad, the opposite of love being wrath, the opposite of light being dark, the opposite of joy being sadness. Hell is the contrast of heaven and the absence of the presence of God. So if your soul has never burned for an answer to that question, what then shall I do? Then let it beckon that question right now. Seeing the separation that you've caused between yourself and the holiness of God by your actions that will then result in eternal condemnation. Let your heart cry out like the Apostle Paul's when he exclaimed, Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will set me free from the body of death. You know? I'm glad you know. <laughs> the law that promises freedom if we abide is the very law that condemns you when you fall. Paul acknowledges his slavery. He knows there is nothing good in him that, can, that he can offer to a holy God that will gain him salvation and God's favor and God's forgiveness. But look, he asks, who? Not what, 
But who will set him free? Not how. Who will set me free from this body of death? Paul is talking from the perspective of a believer in this verse, asking how he's to be freed from his unredeemed humanness. The battle with sin that still remains after we come to faith in Jesus. But if you're a believer, you can ask the very same question. You're all in need of the very same. We're all in need of the very same redemption. So Paul begs to be freed from this body of death. And this, this phrase that he uses, uh, we know Paul is from Tarsus historically. Um, and what he's most likely referring to here is what tradition says. Uh, in Paul's day, an ancient tradition or a tribe near Tarsus, they would tie the corpse of a murder victim to its murderer. And then that would allow the spreading decay to slowly infect and execute the murderer himself. Gruesome. I actually got a picture of this. I don't have a picture of this. I'm kidding. But this is the binding, <laughs> this is the binding that Paul recognizes and the one we must all recognize this morning. Whether you have never placed your faith in Christ to save you from the penalty of your own sin, or if you are a Christian currently battling with sin. How many of you can relate to Paul's words as he laments his current condition in this verse? He says, I don't really understand myself for what I want to do, for, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I have discovered this principle in life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. Something, by the way, that only a believer can say. But there is another power within me that is at war within my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable or wretched man or person that I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? Who will free us from this bondage? Knowledge of this law won't help us. Actually, knowing the law makes matters worse for us. The more we know it, the more we understand about the law, the more we realize how very far, far we fall short. Paul said that he had no idea what coveting was until the law showed him, and then guess what? He was a coveter. Self-determination won't help us. Have you guys ever done this? You've read God's law, and you said, I'm not going to break that one, only to see yourself fall. Paul found himself sinning in ways that weren't even attractive to him. Who in here can say that? I'll be the first to raise my hand. So what then is the way to reconciliation with the Father? John 14, 6. The way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Paul answers his own question, too. He says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. You want to know what gets me out of bed on Sunday mornings? That verse right there. I am so eager to come in here and worship Jesus for verses like that one. Jesus is my deliverer. Jesus Christ is the emancipation from my slavery to the law and his punishment. No longer are we slaves to the law when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and live in obedience to what he asks us to do. No longer is sin your master. When you have faith in this knowledge, it'll set you free. When you determine to fight sin in his power, you will be set free. Since God himself has set you free you must, not, you must give him your allegiance and service. They come, they come hand in hand together. He broke the chains of your oppressor, Satan. He released you from the captivity of sin. 
Our country's founders, they broke the chains of oppression from Great Britain. And on July 4th, 1776, the United States of America declared independence and signed the Declaration. Having been emancipated at great price, who would ever bind themselves to the king of Great Britain ever again? Who would in their right mind exchange their newly purchased freedom paid with blood for the chains of their old slave master? And why being emancipated from the penalty and power of sin by the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on would we, Christians, ever choose to bind ourselves again with our old slave master, sin? A great price was paid for you to be free in this country today. And a greater price was paid for you to be reconciled to God and to be freed to live a life not dominated by sin, by, by God sacrificing his son on your behalf. Amen? Amen? So important to my 17-year-old self was to do my part to preserve the liberties and the values that I believed in when I joined the military. And now, and most important above all else, uh, it's important to ex exclaim the freedom that any man can have in Jesus Christ. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans tells us. If you have ever never trusted Jesus, for your salvation this morning, if you really relied on your good works or your good deeds to earn you favor with God, stop. Jesus said he is the way. If it were possible for you to do it on your own, you wouldn't need a savior. You wouldn't need God to interject. Romans 10.9 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And salvation, given by God for the sins you've committed and, and made holy in his sight, is not something that you can do or that you can earn on your own. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so no one can boast about it. My favorite verse in the Bible. So trust him now. Trust him today. There's no guarantee you'll have tomorrow. And finally, to close, I want to I wanna speak to those of us who are Christians. Don't live in Romans 7. Don't live in fear and condemnation of your sin. Don't live in in defeat. Paul spells out his continual battle in Romans 7. He said, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. This is Paul's experience after becoming a Christian. But do you know what? Paul didn't live there. He experienced it, but he didn't live there. See, my experience for years after I became a Christian, after I came to Christ, was condemnation for all the sins that I committed after I found Jesus, after I became a Christian. As I learned more and more about God, I saw the chasm between his holiness and me. And at times, my guilt would grow so far, so high, that I convinced myself I wasn't a child of God at all. I was living defeated but I want to share with you, because I know some of you, I want to share with you what set me free. See, I stopped reading at Romans 7. I related so perfectly to the, the, the condition that Paul had. I so related to his continuing with that struggle of sin to gain power over it that I said, man, this guy gets me, and I stopped. But Paul doesn't stop. The story doesn't end in defeat for him, but it hits its climax in the very first verse of the next chapter, Romans 8.1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like you. 
period, right? There is no condemnation for those who know Jesus Christ. So quit living in Romans 7 and live victoriously in Romans 8. God freed you when you believed. Your expectation is eternal life at his side. You have his power at your disposal to overcome the sins and the addictions in your life. You can approach his throne with boldness because you have been imputed the very holiness of Jesus Christ himself. Amen? I do want to close with a song, and not a whole lot of songs mean anything to me. Um, but one in particular, I was struggling with this. I was in the, in the depths of this struggle. I lost my joy of salvation. I lost my joy in God. And my old youth pastor said, have you ever heard this song? And he forwarded it to me on YouTube. And ever since that day, I've been set free. Because I'm listening to Jesus. And I'm no longer listening to the lies of Satan. So we're going to play this video I hope you guys find freedom in it like, like I did.
crushed him. They have overthrown him. They have overpowered him. They have triumphed. They have prevailed and beat him. They have vanquished his authority, subdued his accusations, trampled underfoot his lies, and have brought him to his knees at the very feet of his judge, Jesus Christ. We, church, have overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Listen no longer to the lies. Listen no longer to those thoughts that plague you and say, you're not good enough. God doesn't love you. You've sinned. You're cursed and gone astray. You know what you can tell him? Yep, I am. Agree with him, but then praise Jesus because he has declared you innocent, not guilty anyway. Amen? Amen. We do not live in defeat. You live above condemnation in absolute freedom. And in that, we can stand and we can worship God. Amen? Would you guys stand with us? We'll sing one more song.